uh, team from Three Waters to present on the Christchurch Wastewater Treatment Plant Recovery. Um, and uh, so thank you very much for coming um, forward and I'll just hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, kia koutou. Um, I'll just kick off um, on behalf of the team. Um, we're going to follow the normal format. We've got different members of the team um, who will do the presentations to you and we've got the um, whole team here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, thank you, Mayor, for bringing the item forward. Um, we've got um, one of our, or a couple of our team leaving to do another um, I, um, another engagement down at the wastewater treatment plant early this afternoon. So thank you. Yeah. Um, you have got a um, copy of this on the big tin can. Um, my apologies for you getting the presentation quite late. The reason that we give it to you late is that we finalise it in the morning of the presentation. So the um, wastewater treatment plant project, fire recovery project, um, has so many moving parts and things are happening all the time and we want to give you the most up-to-date information, which is why we sort of finalise the presentation right at the last minute. Um, but I'm happy to receive feedback if you do want to get it a little bit earlier. It will just mean that we may not have it as completely up-to-date. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to um, give you the highlights for what's happened over the last two weeks um, and in the different sort of work streams. We'll spend a bit of time on the um, social recovery um, work that we've been doing over the last two weeks, um, and we'll give you we'll signal what we, what's coming up, what we expect to be coming up over the next couple of weeks in terms of um, operations at the plant. So I will now hand over to Michael. Oh, and he'll bring you through the highlights. I was going to do that, but I'll let you do that, Michael. Just go. Morning, everyone. Um, Quick list of highlights there. So there was 26 uh, tonne of uh, filter material was removed over uh, last weekend. Uh, sheet piling for ramp two started yesterday. Um, uh, we are on track to um, complete removal of that media by 7th of September. Uh, the first batch of the uh, pumps that were leaving um, Switzerland um, will be arriving on site tomorrow. So they're all in the country, there's 16 of them. Um, uh, they landed in Auckland uh, a week or so ago. Um, but they came with blank flange plates on them, so they need to be drilled to match the uh, flange plates at the um, wastewater treatment plant. So the first set of eight are due tomorrow, um, and the following eight will come uh, the, a week later. Um, as of 8pm Tuesday, 7th of June, 45% of um, eligible um, uh, households within uh, the, the zone have uh, claimed their grant. Um, there's a social recovery plan underway. Wastewater treatment plant fire communications reference group is um, being formed and there's an adaptive uh, recovery action plan, or version one of it anyway, completed. It's a, it's a, um, a living document, I suppose, um, and these will be talked about further as we progress through the um, presentation. So first up, uh, filter um, media removal from the trickling filters. Uh, the chippers and com compactors arrived, so this is an update, sorry, from the last two weeks. Uh, chippers and compactors were delivered to site last week. Uh, removal of uh, filter material started uh, afternoon, uh, last Friday afternoon. Um, and as previously mentioned, 26 tonne of media has been removed um, over that weekend period and has been delivered to the landfill. Um, there were mechanical issues on Tuesday with the uh, compactor. It's a brand new compactor. Um, it turns out that it's from Germany. Um, there was a solenoid that was installed backwards at the plant, which stopped the automatic degreasing of the machine. So that has been rectified. Um, and removal of media commenced Wednesday. Um, early progress is promising. Um, and as mentioned, we are on program. So, um, and sheet piling for ramp two, as previously mentioned, started yesterday. Now I do apologize. I know you're used to having a nice drone video showing what's been happening. Um, I had technical issues with the, the video, it uh, became corrupted, so you'll have to settle with um, a, a static image there. Um, it shows the uh, media, or a bit of a hole in the media, the media that's been removed. Um, I guess for a, a scale, each of those bales is a, a 500 by 500 by one meter long, or half a meter by half a meter and one, one meter long. Um, and you can see the damage that uh, all those um, bales are black and, and damaged, so um, they get removed, dropped into a chipper, compacted, and then off to um, the landfill. 
I'll now hand over to Helen Beaumont, who will give you an update on um, operational status at the plant. So as you know, we're converting a couple of our clarifiers into aeration basins, and we've uh, got a, a new sludge monitoring equipment that's being tested on those temporary activated sludge systems. So you can just see someone um, pushing that monitoring gear down into the basin. Move it on. Um, work is continuing on the bypass, so we're having to put in a couple of very large pipes to bring the wastewater past the trickling filters uh, and across to the new aeration basins. So that's the inlet end, uh, that's the outlet end, and that's almost complete. Those concrete blocks will come out and there'll be a proper support structure under that. And temporary pumps have been set up. So this is, well, we're waiting for the what are called the Swedish pumps. Uh, these are, we've got some temporary pumps set up to pump over from the aeration basins um, to the existing clarifiers. And what we're doing is we're circulating the sludge so we get good growth of that biomedia and therefore um, good treatment of the effluent to replace what, what the trickling filters were doing previously. We move. Uh, and this is the new pipe work. This is, so this is between the aeration basins, so the converted clarifiers to recirculate that sludge. So that, that, that pipe work is going in at the same time as the bypass pipe work. Uh, just a word on our oxidation ponds. So our oxidation ponds continue to um, perform poorly, uh, given those high organic loads and the cooler temperatures, and we still don't have the aeration basins fully online. So the wastewater discharge to the outfall continues to exceed the standard values for faecal coliforms and enterococci, and we are notifying Environment Canopy and the Medical Officer of Health as we're required under the conditions of our consent. Um, in response, we've increased our beach sampling to twice per week, and so far the results at the beach have all been within the standard values, so we're um, pleased that, that that's not coming back onto the beaches. So remember that's at um, New Brighton at the Surf Club, then at South New Brighton, and then across at um, Sumner. Uh, and just a word there about the foaming at Scarborough Beach that was investigated and it's a natural occurrence and it's happening down the coast. You'll, you might see some pictures online of Caroline Bay uh, where they've had it several times this year. So that's um, diatom growth in the waves that then gets broken up and brings that scummy brown uh, formation on the beach. That's correct. Nigel's up now. Hi, Nigel Grant, Environmental Monitoring. So the air sampling, we've, we've completed six rounds of what we'll call, we've called grab sam samples. Uh, the last one was done yesterday. Five of those have been posted online on, on, um, on, our, on our blog, and we've put, uh, we've put plain English as best we can, descriptions of each of those as well, but we, quite, we do want to show the, the laboratory printed results, so there's no question that, you know, we need this, changes made that shouldn't be so and we'll the last one will go up uh, to, tomorrow we'll have those results today today I'm sure to, sometime today they'll go up tomorrow and we'll also put up a, a statement about just the meaning of those how they relate to the others now that we've completed the six rounds that that's the end of that we'll we'll obviously also put out a um, a full report on that which and that will include a um, if you like a plain English explanation of what we've found and so so far what we have found is that the hydrogen sulfide has it's been shown to be a good indicator gas for the area affected um, it's been consistently admitted from the ponds and it's easy to monitor um, and and so that's and it's been detected at levels which are which are causing nuisance to people the medical officer of health also spoken about that and spoken with us so it, it does cause irritation to people but the, the levels go up and down. Some of the levels have, have been um, fairly high, but they're not, they're not always like that. And at this stage, as, as we correspond regularly with the Medical Officer of Health, it seems to be fairly comfortable with where we are on that. Um, but yet, as I say, that it's been detected at levels which, which cause a nuisance, and it'll, that'll, probably, that'll form the basis of our new um, monitoring regime as we go forward. We have already been using one continuous monitor that we've trialled that to see how effective it is. It's, it's been pretty effective and it, 
it basically shows allows continuous real time. It will produce some good when we deploy those further. That they'll produce some good graphs for us, and that they'll be a, they'll be able to um, give us a better idea. Put stuff up on on the public facing website, and people will be able to see those those that type of information and interpret it much easier than what we've been um, receiving to date. We expect that uh, more of those monitors to be deployed next uh, available to us and to be deployed next week. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. Thanks, Michael, for the next one. So, collaborative meeting with Medical Officer of Health and Environment Canterbury. These are occurring on a weekly basis. I take the notes for those myself. We'll make those available. Uh, and. Um, so the, the things that we're discussing, we're obviously discussing the agreement on the next steps in the monitoring plan, and uh, we anticipate that a number of monitors will be placed in fixed locations and also we'll be able to use mo a couple of mobile monitors to respond to um, odour, odour reports and complaints. We do share those, as, as part of that, our meeting, as soon as we receive them, I, I forward them on to ECAN and... Um, and, and also the medical, medical officer of health. So we, sh we share those results and we discuss them at our weekly meeting. And, it's, and there has been a question about peer review, but at this stage, we, we have an independent um, specialist, air, um, air quality specialist who is, who's doing the sampling for us and inter interpreting the results. The medical officer of health also has a, access to a separate air quality specialist that the ministry funds, and they also provide comment to us. So. We're getting some pretty good um, comment for it for us at the moment. So um, yeah, that, that's that's where we are on that one. It was also raised about whether we should involve NIWA in in our deliberations. We have I've asked our air quality monitoring specialist to reach out to NIWA. She hasn't had a response back yet, but we'll we'll follow that up um, this this week and next week as well. And equally, also there was a at our last. Last meeting, there was, it was moved that we request of the um, CDHB that they they establish a health register for for this in response to this. We discussed that at, at our meeting with them and have sent the formal request to them, and they have indicated they'll they'll send a formal response back to us in due course. Uh, and that's yeah. So paint staining, the um, yeah. So we've we've obviously received. A number of reports about paint staining both both sides of the treatment plant and residential areas, if you like. Uh, we've I think we've probably had about 30 or 40 come to us. When you when you hear of what's online and also the people you talk to talk about their neighbours, there's there's obviously more out there as well. As I indicated at the um, last time I spoke to you, we engaged a specialist firm. They have been out on site and carried out some. Uh, took, took samples and they're in the laboratory now and I'm told that we'll have those next week so we'll know a lot more about what the um, final cause of that, that staining is. And just finally, uh, so noise, noise measurements, we've, um, we've had start, so the, the chipping started, started on well what I, I call trickling field, the, fir the first one if you like. The, re the readings as expected were, were, were fairly high but they're well sheltered. Um, it's, it's because of the sheet piling and the heavy AP65 between. That that chipper is well sheltered from the uh, residential area, and we've, but we've been doing monitoring both along the Shortland Street area to ensure that the noise readings were compliant with the New Zealand construction noise standards, and also obviously we've done monitoring on the plant side where where, where it's more directly exposed to the chipper. So that that's, and we've also and yeah employed a, a f independent firm to provide us with advice on noise noise attenuation around for that second chipper as well. So that's pretty much where we are. So thank you. Good morning, everybody. Sure, you know who I am. Um, for those listening, um, Gary Watson. I'm leading the um, the support package at the moment on behalf of council. Um, first thing I'd like to do is thank the community for their patience and the hundreds and hundreds of conversations I've had over the last ten days, and um, it's been it's been fantastic. Um, people's response to the whole thing has 
has been great. Um, is everyone happy? No, I'm not saying that. But in terms of interaction um, with the community, it's it's been a really nice experience and a, and a good experience. Um, we continue to have four community providers um, delivering the package, and I'd like to thank them for the job that they're doing. Um, uh, as of uh, Tuesday, actually I can update these dates, as of last night, after our second late night, um, we've processed through um, almost 1,800 um, in-zone grants, 48 out-of-zone grants, which is about 54% of um, in-zone grants at the moment. Um, and probably, uh, I'd say approximately 90% of those have been Prezi cards that people have been able to choose what they um, spend that on. Uh, as I said, we've done two late nights at the Bromley Centre. Um, as council staff, we staff those. Um, our, for people who work the nine to five, um, and again, we've had some some good comments about being able to, you know, extend hours. Um, here, Wakatapu is the only agency that's open on the weekends, but you can see eight thirty to three. Um, though nobody was open on the long weekend, um, uh, so this will be the first weekend. Um, applications are taking pretty much two minutes. Um, they're pretty quick. Uh, a lot of comments about didn't think it would be as easy as that. Um, we've had a little bit of um, interesting things with uh, a very low number of people trying on the system, but that's what you expect when you have a process like this. Um, I've done quite a number of home deliveries to elderly people and people who have mobility issues. Um, and also spent some time with the residents along, some of the residents along Shortland Street who are very close to the plant. So, um, yeah, we're having some good personal conversations. Uh, support for schools. So we met with a number of school principals along with the Mayor um, and MOE last week and managers of early learning centres. Um, they've asked for some time to have a look at how they would like to use the package. Um, but I'll chase it up this week and see how we're going. Um, the approach is really, um, we are doing this in partnership with MOE. As you can see, the Ministry of Ed are picking up the air purifiers for all the schools. They've made that commitment to their schools. Um, so we're looking at other things that we can offer to support the, the tamariki while they're learning and in their break time. Um, and there is a rumour that um, we may be going into a science fair in the fourth term. Um, the one thing we did get back from education was that the kids are really interested in this process. And so uh, the idea of the science fair could be around the whole plant. Um, so that was something that I hadn't expected but came out pretty strong. Um, I think it's to do with poo, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and then the social recovery plan. So as you can see, um, now we haven't had, conf well, I'm, I'm unsure of the confirmed attendance in Friday's meeting, but as you can see, Ministry of Education, excuse me, MSD, Crown Public Health, and Canterbury District Health Board, which isn't up there. Uh, the plan will include all the work streams in the community support package, including the workshops and everything, and try and combine it together for a good welfare health response. Uh, that's really me at the moment. Uh, kia ora koutou. I'm Simon Maka. I'm the Senior Comms Advisor at Council. Um, so just giving you a bit of a communications update of what we've been up to over the past two weeks. Um, so on Thursday, we distributed a Startworks notice about the chipper noise, um, potential increase in noise, um, and had that delivered that afternoon before it all started. Um, the rolling blog continues to, on Newsline, continues to put out at least two to four um, stories every day. I think the busiest day was six updates in one day. Um, so definitely getting the information out there. Weekly e-news are still going out there, and we're updating the website um, several times a week as well. We've done a, um, a joint comms plan with Trans Waste uh, in the Huranui and Waimakariri District Councils around the um, truck movements up to Cape Valley, um, just to make sure we're all on the same on the same page with everything. And we've sent we're all sharing the same key messages, um, and they've provided those to their elected members and their um, executive leadership teams as well. Uh, around the community support package, we put out a lot of information. So we had um, 3,600 booklets printed, um, and they were all delivered to the homes within the eligible area on both sides of those bordering roads. 
Um, we had newsline updates, um, social media updates, e-newsletter went out, and we're doing hard copy e-newsletters that are now provided um, at the community providers as well. Um, we put out internal communications and information for all council staff, so that was um, put on both Yammer and the Hub. Um, and the Q&As uh, for, for providers and community service, have, uh, customer service, sorry, have all been developed as well. And we've also done the information panels uh, for community providers and for Eastgate Mall, which is basically um, a shortened version of what's in the booklets and a nice two metre high plinth um, that people can yeah, just access and read nice and easily. So coming up, um, we're going to keep, keep the ball rolling. Um, so we're going to have the rolling blog information and updates continuing to go out. Um, this afternoon there's a media opportunity on site um, to, so that the media can um, film the filter extraction and uh, see the material being, pu material being pulled out of those trickling filters. Uh, we'll continue responding to questions and updates uh, about the community support and the on-site works. Uh, we've done some development of the video, so we did, a film, uh, did some filming with Helen yesterday on site around um, what we're doing um, to get around, uh, you know, modify the plant as such after the fire so that we can continue operating. Um, there's e-news that are going out this week and with that we're going to have an infographic um, that has, just breaks down all the information around the, um, the, the trickling filter removal uh, made really clear and nice and easy around, you know, how many tons is being removed, um, how many truckloads is going out, you know, what the weather forecast is going to be and that sort of thing. Um, and we'll just keep providing updates um, around the, the, the pumps as they, as they land um, and as they get installed and um, yeah, get all the, all the information out there. Excellent. Um, so um, related to that and um, in response to the um, request last meeting, um, the, the finance and performance meeting, um, we are in the process of setting up the um, communications reference group. Um, so we've had an initial um, meeting with the um, with the boards and the local um, councillors um, to talk about the terms of reference and um, who they will be nominating to put on the reference group from the community. Um, so I've just included up there the um, draft purpose and responsibility um, of the reference group. So we um, we are anticipating about eight community members um, as an ideal number of of people to be talking to around um, feedback on how we do our communications. Um, we expect the first meeting to be um, next week um, and um, we'll be holding those meetings um, electronically in the evenings, recognising that um, some of the members who will be put forward to be on that group will probably have day jobs, so we're going to make it as easy as possible. So we're anticipating um, at least weekly meetings with that group. And we will have the um, community board members and local councillors um, attending as observers to those meetings. So the, the primary purpose is to give us feedback on the best way to communicate to the wider community and the best um, and, and the sort of messages that the community want to hear. Morena, morning, Carolyn Gallagher. Um, so last time when we met, you asked, how do all the balls in the air, all the effort that's going on, how do all the work streams work together? So that was the challenge, and um, we took that on board, and what we have developed is um, what's termed an adaptive recovery action plan, which is basically an overview of how all of these complex work streams work together, what are the time frames, what are the outcomes, um, and then what are the risks, etc., and then how do they link together. So we've got that version um, ready. We will send it uh, to you this afternoon, uh, bearing in mind it's version one, and then um, we can only uh, seek to make it more clear and understandable. Um, on the back of it, um, for your information, should something like this appear, is a Gantt chart of the various work streams, including the highly technical, the scientific, the recovery, the community and the social recovery work, and how they're all linked together and where we're at in terms of the timeline. Thanks, Caroline. Um, 
just a bit of an overview of what's coming up. Um, so next week we've got uh, presenting to, uh, well, in a report to Audit, Audit and Risk Committee, 15th of June, uh, followed the next day by a, a presentation to the Insurance Subcommittee. Uh, also looking at doing a daytime and evening um, community meeting on the 28th of uh, June. Uh, that dates to, to be times and date to be to con confirmed. Uh, then at the end of the month, we've got a, a presentation to Finance and Performance Committee, um, and we're also looking at putting together a webinar for the community um, in early uh, July. And we've got our ongoing um, catch-ups with Environment Canterbury and uh, the Canterbury District Health Board. So what's coming up in the next couple of weeks? Um, the pumps for the aeration basins are arriving on site in two batches, as mentioned previously, um, end of this week and end of next week. Um, all pumps will be installed by the 24th of June, um, with improved quality uh, of discharge going to the oxidation ponds achieved by 15th of July. Um, our continuous air monitoring devices will be uh, ro rolling out next week. Uh, sheet piling for ramp two is expected to be completed within the next two weeks. Uh, the first meeting of the Wastewater Treatment Plant Fire Communications uh, Reference Group um, will be happening next week, and uh, removal, obviously, of the filter media will be continuing over that period of time. So, in summary, I guess the main points to take away from today's presentation um, is that we are on track uh, to meet completion by 7th of September, um, albeit early days. Uh, sheet piling for Ramp 2 has started. Oxidation ponds continue to struggle under the high organic load, cooler temperatures and reduced sunshine hours. Uh, paint samples have been collected from a, a grouping of houses um, that are showing paint discoloration and uh, being tested as we speak, with results uh, expected next week. Uh, noise measurements from the chipper, as Nigel talked about earlier, um, were below the construction standard limits at the Shortland Street boundary. Um, and I think it was 54% now of all in zone eligible applicants have claimed uh, the grant as of uh, yesterday. Um, our social recovery plan is underway and our waste water treatment plant fire communications reference group meeting uh, is being held next week. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. That's an excellent presentation and... Um very pleased to see um, such a quick response to the issues that have been raised from around the table, um, including the adaptive recovery plan. And I really like that word adaptive because it's obviously going to be with a complex environment um, constantly changing. So that's that's a very good um, model to adopt. Um, uh, Aaron. Thank you. And my, um, I've got two questions. They're probably both for Helen, um, of course. And... Uh, Helen, on the organic matter, so the other day I was using my incinerator at home and I was thinking to myself, at this time, should we be using incinerators across the city? Like, is that something we can do? Does that help or does it not matter at all? Never helps. <laughs> Better to put in your compost bin. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but we're not <laughs> saying to the entire public. That would help. Yes, it, if it you would put help. In your so bin, why don't you. we do a voluntary ban on incinerators across the whole city for until this is fixed? It's a very small proportion of the load, so uh, it, wouldn't it wouldn't matter, make a noticeable difference. Down. You keep on putting it down there. Okay. Yeah, well. I, ha I haven't got one, and I mean I've, I've understood that they're not a good thing to add to households, but yeah, that, could that, be seen as an environmental crime. Knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Always a good idea to raise these um, voluntary efforts that people can make to contribute to easing the load. Yeah, but if it doesn't, then it doesn't. So, um, yeah. uh, but it's environmental crime. Yeah, um, and then the uh, the other one is around the smell. Do we know now that we're getting down into the filter? That's the main smell, or is it the ponds? Are we it, getting a clear indication? It continues to be the ponds, so right. there hasn't been any noticeable change or shift as we've excavated the material from the um, trickling filters so far. However, the trickling filter odour has always de been dependent on a combination of weather events. So it was the rain followed by the hot weather that set that off in March and through those warm months, and we haven't got that at the moment. So I'm quite hopeful um, from that trial that... That, that won't be a big source, but we'll just watch it as it goes. So then on the glass half full, uh, 
once those pumps are operational by the end of... So once, once the pumps go, go in, we'll have um, full load on those new aeration basins, yep. and those new aeration basins will take three to six weeks for the biology to settle and improve the treatment, and then it takes another three to six weeks for everything to pass through the ponds. So yes, over the next few weeks, as those pumps go in and the aeration basins mature and the ponds improve, we'll see a reduction in those odours. That's good to hear. So it could be earlier than the start of spring, could be August. It certainly should be earlier than the start of spring. That's good news. Right, I've got um, Celeste and then Yanni and Phil. Um, I've got a few quick questions. Um, firstly, around the air monitors um, and the paint sampling, um, can I just get a bit more information about where that's been done in terms of the geographic areas? Uh, we, we are going to put a map up for those air monitoring sites and we're also going to get um, a graphical representation of some of those results. Uh, we've, just, we've just been delayed a little bit on that, but yes, we'll make sure we get maps up on that. In terms of the paint sampling results, we're not going to provide maps of that because that would identify individual houses, um, but we can, we can illustrate the areas where we've taken samples. Um, and then the other quick questions in terms of the um, sort of response to some of the health and, and sort of wellbeing impacts from the stench. It's great that we're looking at sort of working more closely with ECAN and um, the CDHB on the health uh, sort of data collection. Have we raised the issue of actually providing support, more support for people in terms of access to medical care or other forms of support outside of collecting data? The, the Medical Officer of Health and Community Public Health are taking a coordinated approach to that, so um, we'd need to raise that question directly with them if you're talking about uh, a specific medical support. We'd need to raise that with Community Public Health. I can't answer that. Okay, well that would be great if we could get some sort of feedback on that option. And then um, finally, just last couple of things. In terms of the um, reference group, it's really great and thanks to staff who've been working on that. We, I feel like we're making really good progress. In terms of the purpose of that group, um, I just want to be make sure that it's not just about sort of signing off on communications, it's about making sure that we've got a community-led response to issues so that we're working in partnership with communities so that when we talk about it, we're clear that it's not just about sort of providing another channel for information. So my understanding of the request was it was feeding back to us um, advice on how we do our communications better um, rather than the broader welfare, community-led welfare response, if that is what it is intended to be, if that's the expectation of elected members, um, we may have to rethink who we have on that group. Well, I think that, um, that you're both correct. So... Um, I think what Celeste is saying, and it's not not, and I mean, kick me if I'm. Oh, you can't. You're not here. Um, if I'm if I'm wrong, but the 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 purpose um, because this relates back to an approach that we adopted after the um, the the um, red zoning of the Port Hills and the cliff collapse and the um, challenges yeah. in that environment, and we had a group and who 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 sat in on briefings so that they had a deep understanding um, themselves that would have then assist in how that was communicated to the public. So it was also feeding in what the public needed to know as well as um, really having a, a real good line of sight over all of the information that's coming to the community board and the council so that they can then um, assist in that process and translating that into plain language to get out to the community. Yep, is, yep. Is, do you see it as, is that right? Yeah, I think that's a, a great uh, explanation. I, I would add that um, some of the things that the group might propose is saying, you know, around things like having community meetings, sort of feeding in some suggestions around it is still communications, but it's sort of how yeah. we respond to some of those issues. So Absolutely. it's just making it clear when we go out to the community that it, it's not just signing off on things. It's no, actually it, absolutely not. That. And I think I think that, I mean, one of the things that I fed back in myself was that um, 
nighttime meetings didn't work for um, particularly older people. We're not going to go out in the middle of winter um, in the cold and the dark at seven o'clock at night. And so the result of that has been the proposal to have a daytime meeting as well as a nighttime meeting. So um, and that, that so I think that that's it, but it's broader. It's it's not just here are the communications we're planning. What do you think about them? Will you sign off on them? That's not what we're proposing. And that, that would be your understanding too, Jane? Yeah, I, and I think, um, yes, so the group that will be the reference group will, actually even if we didn't want to control it, which we absolutely don't, will be, uh, will be feeding back the information that we're sharing with them back to the community. Absolutely, that will happen, yeah. That's great. Sorry, final quick thing is around the, the smell coming from the ponds, I'm aware in terms of distance, that's actually geographically quite close to South Brighton. Have we sort of looked at sort of, because it's not just the trickling field, because there's actually a whole other area that actually has other different impacts on potentially different communities and how we approach the response. I'm aware that we'll work through some of this through the reference group, but I just wanted to sort of bring that up as a comment more than a question, I guess. So when we when we have the new hydrogen sulfide monitors, uh, which do continuous monitoring, so um, we'll have instead of having one grab sample a week, we'll have, you know, three samples every hour, uh, every day of the week. Those monitors we do intend to place one in South Brighton to um, to check what what is happening over there when the wind is from the southwest quarter rather than from the northeast quarter. So yes, we will put one over there so that we understand what the exposure is. I think people are clear about the difference between the grab um, mm -hmm. monitoring and the con continuous monitoring. Yeah. So when the continuous monitoring gets underway more more extensively, you've got one in at the moment, but when it's more extensive, then you'll have one out at South Brighton. Yes. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I've got uh, Yanni and then Phil. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, thank, thank you for the update and the work that you've been doing. Um, I look forward to getting a copy of that recovery plan. Um, sorry, the adaptive um, yep. plan. Uh, I think that would be really good. I, I, I did note that we have the resolutions that we passed as a council around that community group were to look at the communications, um, the well-being, and the environmental issues. So I think, you know, and I've certainly fed that in, that I think there is scope for that group to look broader than just the communications yeah. um, as a reference group. So, uh, I mean, I didn't hear any pushback on that at the time. So I think that that's just can be incorporated. Um, I just I just wanted to chat on a few, on a few things. Um, how did we come up with the quantum of two hundred dollars per household? Uh, yeah, and what process? Yanni, Yanni, do Yanni, you... This is just an update. This is just an update. So this is not. Um, I mean, without prior notice of a whole lot of questions. Um, oh, okay. Well, I'll just I'll put it another way then. Just we, we had a debate debate about um, that, so I don't want to revisit an issue that we addressed at another meeting. Cool. If it okay. needs to be Can... readdressed or addressed in an appropriate way, then we'll find an sure. appropriate way to address it. Can Can staff please just advise what what work stream or what work they're doing? To give effect to the council resolutions from two weeks ago, which is to report back to council, the community board, and the community on the application of grant funding, and come back to council if further funding is required. Um, and also noting under resolution four that staff will review the support package and report back on any recommended future measures. And resolution five that staff reassess the areas that have a high number of complaints. What was the date of that resolution? Such as yeah. um, what that's was the date? from. Two weeks ago, sorry. Two weeks ago, yeah. right. Thank you. So, thank um, you, thank you, Gary. Yeah, Could so you I just, update us in the last two weeks, apart from what you've already told us? Oh, and I just wanted to kind of understand the process for looking at what other support needs are being raised and how that's being recorded and then how that's looking forward. Right. Uh, can I take them one at a time? So can you give me the first one? Sorry. It'll just make it easier to answer. At a yep. high level, what I'm, yep. what I'm trying to understand is... When we agreed to the support package, yep. so, some of us were concerned that. Yanni, yep. we raised it two weeks ago. We raised it two yep. weeks ago. We've asked Sorry. staff to so the area ask for an update. Yeah. So I could give you some feedback. So on um, at the moment, we've had about 140 out of zone requests. 
Of those, we had um, eight uh, over the last two weeks have come from South Shore or Brighton. So that's less than 5% of requests out of zone have come from there. Um, the rest of them uh, predominantly have come from Linwood, Wollstone and um, up into Aranui, but close to the border. So um, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that the way the wind blows um, through the bottom of that bulb, if it was ever to be extended, it would probably go that way. And so that's what we're seeing at the moment from people who are asking out of zone. Um, in terms of um, the ability to do it at the moment, I mean, we're, we're two weeks into it. Um, we had the numbers collected. We've had 1,800 people come. Um, at the moment, we think we've got the zone about right, looking at the number of exemptions that are coming in. But if they were, we think they know. We, the majority of them are heading towards the south right. to Aranui, Linwood and Wollstone. So, so I'm just trying to understand the process for getting those areas either extended into those areas mm -hmm. or for a, a report to come back to extend it. Just not quite sure what the process of it would be around that. So until, yeah, okay. So I think, for me, I think it's important that we've already set a zone until we know that the large majority of people access, or who are eligible have been able to access it. But the next step would definitely be, so that's probably another week to 10 days away at the rate we're going. Um, at the next update, I should be able to say that we've completed X amount within the zone and that uh, these are the numbers that we are hearing outside of the zone. And my recommendation, if you chose to, this is what it would be. But this you would provide us with a report in advance of the meeting for us to consider it's, rather than um, just uh, raising it mm -hmm. in an oral report at the council. Yeah. So it, it, it may be um, um, a memo rather than a, yeah. a report, but I, I will try and have something um, to well before the meeting. Before so yeah. Just, just I mean, to be really clear, I mean, if we are going to be recommending any changes, we will be including that in the report with rec clear recommendations yeah. to the, the yeah. body. Um, just remember, we're also um, preparing a social recovery plan, and that yeah. will cover off the broader welfare issues. So at the moment, we're just talking about, I guess, the prezi cards or the, the yeah. financial support. Um, but the, the wellbeing support is broader than just the small package. Um, and the um, social recovery plan will be outlining all that, and we will be pres uh, we will be bringing that back to the council. So, with the contact with the no, just can we can we can we have your other questions, please? Um, it's been relatively clearly asked and answered, and I do want to move on to other items on the agenda. I mean, I'll just put these through the offices to see if you want. Um, but just wanted to get um, you've made the approach to the CDHB. Ministry of Health for our Health Register. We haven't had a response. I know you've had the weekly meetings. I don't know what the agreed outcomes are from those meetings. Um, are, you, are you able to provide us and the community as well? Because obviously with the health issue that people are really worried about, it would be really good for the community to have visibility of what is being discussed, what's been agreed. So um, do we have a time frame for a response around the Health Register? Um, and I mean, do you have any sense of we're looking at weeks, months? We days? don't have a time frame for the response, but right. we have discussed that with um, the medical office of health, and she has undertaken to get back to us. Right. So she'll get back to us when she gets back to us. I don't think we'll have to wait weeks or months. Because I was just concerned in your presentation that there's a, um, you say sorry, it's just on the air sampling. Um, Sorry, I, I don't know. But the air sampling, we've like. completed the first six weeks of the program. Yeah. We're now going to review all of that information with Environment Canterbury and the Medical Officer of Health and the two specialists that we've got engaged. Yeah, sorry. And I, then we're going to propose the next round of sampling. Yeah, I, I understand that. But the comment in the presentation is, has been detected at levels which are causing nuisance and require further follow up to confirm if there is a potential risk to health. Um, and so, really, I guess. It would be really good to know um, just some timeframes around that collaborative approach with CDHB and community public health around um, when they can make that assessment. But also, it's linked to the evidence base. Right. So what we've done to date is identify the gases that make up the odour. Yeah. Um, and from that work, um, we need to review it. But it looks almost certain that hydrogen sulphide will be the key indicator. But I don't want to preempt meeting with Environment Canterbury, meeting with the Medical Officer of Health, and deciding that together. Um, 
And then once we have continuous monitoring of hydrogen sulphide, we'll have a much better understanding whether or not those levels that at the moment are causing nuisance, but not over any sort of physical health limits, are a well health and well-being concern. But we need that better data set. We need that continuous monitoring to understand that. Right. So that's the data that we'll, we're starting to collect now. We've got one metre in place. We've got two about to arrive, and we've got... Six or eight on order. <laughs> okay. Is there anything that's going into people's houses so we can measure what's happening inside people's houses? We will have, we will have permanently located meters outside and we will have two mobile meters where we can also check inside. So we've got a comprehensive program. Yeah. What we don't have is all the answers. And you wouldn't expect to have all the answers at this stage. No, and we're very keen that, that we do provide good evidence so we have a good understanding of what the issues are. Yeah. Okay, um, just wanted to check on... I've got Phil got other before questions. you, Anne. Anne, just I've the, got Phil next. No, uh, just can I just check on the Ministry of Education? So they've asked for more time, but, but obviously the kids, I mean, you know... They're... Sorry, they've, sorry, Yanni, stop it. Look, you've heard that um, staff have met with the Ministry of Education, that there are a number of issues that they've... Um, that they are working through. The ministry itself is providing resources directly yeah, sorry, into the schools. I, I was just it's to, about what we can do collaboratively together. I appreciate they want more time. I was just trying to understand if there was any short-term things that we could do. For those of us that were at that first community meeting, we heard pretty clear the concern that people expressed about the children and the schools. We, Yanni, so is there anything we can do in the short term? We have met with them. I mean, you've heard that from staff. Staff have met with the Ministry of Education. They've met with two different groups, the schools, they've met with the um, early childhood um, centres, and there are, there are further discussions to be had. So you will be reported back to in due course. So, Phil. Right. Um, with the insurance, we got $10 million on at the start. I'd imagine just looking at pumps from Sweden and pumps in the aerator and yada, yada, yada. We've burned through that. Have we got more from them? or And if we haven't, how are we paying for work? Yeah, that's so we don't have any issue at the moment with the insurance payments, but we will be reporting in detail to the insurance committee last week, so I'd sort of prefer to leave all the details of how we're managing the insurance to the insurance committee, if okay. that's okay. Uh, and then you'll tell us then more so whether it's going to be repaired or demoed? Or do, you, do you know that yet? We don't know that yet, no. But, we don't know that okay. yet. Okay, no. because one of, one of the things I'm concerned about, if, can you go back to the, one of the very first photos, please? Here you go. Uh, here, there, that one. Now, did we look at, because lo looking in there under the first half metre of the damaged stuff at the top, did we ever look at just taking the top off, because everything looks very similar to the day I was down there when they were putting it in, and just taking the top off and maybe just topping it up with new ones and, and using it again? <clears throat> Couldn't do that? The the fire smouldered away for near on three weeks or longer. Yeah. Um, so that smouldering wasn't just from the top. So so there's what, definitely damage right to the bottom? Not sure. Okay. So what, what, once we remove more, we'll be able to see. That's only a small well, portion that's been taken. One of the things that concerns me is if we do decide to keep it at this stage, whatever happens, and we're up to the insurance company, one of the things on the chart that I saw the other day was that the contractor was going to perhaps demolish the false floor in the bottom of the um, trickle filters. Should we be telling them to um, try and not damage that, to use a different system or different machines? Because if we rebuild it, we don't want to have to be rebuilding a floor as well, if we don't have to. Um, can we come back to you with the, um, those answers to those sort of technical questions? So oh. I might have the oh. answer to that one because I've just been working through that. Yeah. Oh, right. They have been instructed to take extreme care on the floor and avoid those piles that are underneath that support. Because there's a false floor that holds yes. it up. Yep. So that was one of the concerns that was raised last night with the contractor. Yeah. Um, they have yeah, instructed the operator to take extreme care in there and there will be a dogman watching from the top that will be able to see what's going on and identify where those parts are to communicate with that operator to avoid. Yeah, because in the long run, from what I understand, they're going to put a machine in there. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that's, no worries. Yeah, and that's all we can cover off. So, just so, and, and I'm sure um, Helen said, the day that the, the button is pushed on the Swedish pumps is the 24th of June, is it? 
around about right. Uh, sounds about right. Sounds about right. Sounds about right. So we do okay. have temporary pumps already working. Yes, so, but yeah. the new the new ones yep. will okay. No, that's all right, and uh, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> so what, what I might do is um, <clears throat> also because I, I mean, there's obviously some questions around. You know, the, they look very black in the front, but not at the back. Mm. So um, we'll get some further advice on all of that. But what I might do is just get for those technical questions. If you can, if if you could submit them in writing, and 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 we could assess them next week at the insurance subcommittee. Just start. That um, not start, but continue that um, that detailed look at some of the um, technical side. Uh, Anne, yeah, just in terms of the the live data, um, keeping um, a record of those who are coming in and, and receiving support. Um, that's. Can you explain how that how you're collating that information? I know Gary's not here. No, he is. Oh, he is. No, yes. Great. We've got a database. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a SharePoint database between the four uh, agencies and ourselves. So um, as someone comes in, we check the address, um, we process the payment, and it is taken out straight away. Um, the only times we've had is there's been some bills have been changed, and so some addresses have doubled up. But other than that, uh, it is live, and we have had occasions where um, there's been some quick drives around to the next one, but it's already been tagged off. Wow. So it's pretty confident that it's the safest and the best way we can do it. And the other thing I wanted to know was just in terms of the doctor's appointments, um, mm -hmm. if someone comes and needs to have an appointment, can't pay, and they've come to a community hub, how does that work? Yeah, so um, we haven't really had a lot of them. Um, we uh, Bromley has the availability. They rang all their doctors, and we're ready to do that. But people have chosen to take a card, and they can pay their doctors with the card. And then they can pay the chemist as well, and they can, yeah. So that's been the best way. Okay, thank you very much. Aisha, and you both asked those questions, but I just wanted people to understand the amount of work that has gone into setting up these systems. And Gary, you've been amazing, and, and so has the rest of the team, and we're really grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I switched it back on. Somebody might have overridden me, <laughs> but I wanted to. I wanted to. I wanted you to uh, not to be an assistant after all. Um, you, you're assisting the councillors now. Um, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge Gary uh, Watson as well. He's um, just really contributed so much and to the community. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Night and day. Um, Yanni. Thanks. Just um, had, a, had a, kind of just picking up on the point that has been raised um, before, and this is a question that I have previously submitted, and I, you kind of touched on it in the presentation, but I just wasn't quite clear how we're going to explain it. So that, the question was, how can we explain and monitor the impact of the stench from the trickling filters versus the ponds, and what the temporary solutions are possible to recreate some sort of trickling process to reduce odour if we need to? I think that requires a little bit of the extra work um, in terms, because okay. it is a communication thing. I have struggled to get my head around that exact issue. Yeah, and okay. um, I've got it in my head, but I don't think that even I could describe it in plain language um, sufficiently well to answer that question I, I here thought, and now. But that okay. needs to be on the website yeah. and and really clear for people to understand yeah. the difference. And I think, just to, you know, again, commend Helen Beaumont for the very first presentation she gave, which was excellent at showing the different components and how they were contributing to what what we thought the problem was. Um, yeah. And I know that and there's that, a lot that, of monitoring. That explained yeah. what was going on in the ponds yeah. really well. Yeah. But the impact cool. of the trickling filters was really not felt until so March. So just another question was, um, have we talked to Christchurch and Z? One of the concerns that was raised from the community is support for local businesses. So is anyone doing any work on um, liaising with local businesses or through Christchurch and Z to check on support? Yes, we'll be following up on, on that this week. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to check, there's um, a concern that after the fire that there was some um, dumping into or untreated sewage being um, discharged um, into the oxidation ponds. Do, do we know if that 
if that happened into what quantum? So you're talking back in November? Yeah, yeah. Um, can we get back to you on that? Okay, cool. It's just this concern that um, there was a lot of uh, 2 million litres of untreated sewage discharged into the oxidation ponds. And I just wanted to check um, if that happened and also what's the process to clean it up. If it, can you if forward it that one through, Yanni, so that yeah. we're clear of this? Cool. So, um, and, and final question from me, thank you, is just in regards, oh, sorry, there's two quick questions. One was, I, I know you've given me some information back on the air purifiers, but I, I, as part of the recovery plan that you're looking at, are you looking at that sort of support where people can access other types of things to deal with the odour? Sorry, it's a long way to walk back and say, um, and, and say um, it is something we can consider, but um, you know, we've, we've answered the question several times. To buy a thousand air purifiers, um, we end up with a thousand air purifiers. I totally get what you're after. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's the most practical thing to do, but that, but we will look at it through that process. Okay, because I have previously asked if we can talk, and, I, and again, I don't know who the experts are, but yep. to get some advi practical advice for people, how to mitigate or reduce the odour impacts in the, on their properties and home. Yep. Um, so I don't, yeah, hopefully that can be picked up as part of that. Um, and just the final question from me is just in terms of the actual removal of the trickling filter material. Um, we, we heard at the start, um, of this process that there's some concern around um, the operating hours of Cape Valley and then also um, there's the capacity of the trucks and the chipper so I know there's lots of different moving parts but from what we've seen with the current work that we're doing um, have, have we identified any constraints that means that if they weren't there we could do this quicker like I mean double shifting has been an idea that you know obviously I've raised um, that we work longer hours. I know you've got and noise so issues. So just wanted to check. Are there any issues that have been raised by way of constraints with getting the stuff to Cape Valley? Yep, no, so we haven't hit any constraints at the moment, but we are talking to the operators of Cape Valley who are very open to um, looking at extended hours if we need it. So there are active um, conversations that we're having with them. Um, and we're also looking at truck capacity and so, so on. Yeah, so, so the question it's was, it's an ongoing thing that we is, are looking at. Is there at. any resource that if we had, um, that could speed up the removal of the tripping filter material? Not at this stage, no. There's no resources that are? No, nothing that we think that we need at this stage. But we're week one of removing the yeah, filter material. Yeah. Certainly. All right. Um, Anne. <coughs> I'm sure, you know, these are good questions, but I'm just wondering if there's a, a better system that we could have in place so that the, inf the questions that are being asked could be actually... Uh, the information could be brought into the updates so that we don't have to ask them again. Um, so that we would, would there, is there a way that we could make that work? So and that can you can you can you just direct that up to the top yep. table? Because um, Dawn and I will take that on board and find a better way. Um, we felt that with a, the presentational approach that we wouldn't have this, um, and so we have just restructured the way that we do things. Um, in order to in order to make this a meaningful opportunity for the public to see what's going on, which was the whole intention of fortnightly reports. We don't normally have fortnightly reports on issues. This shows how important this council feels that this issue is, that we've made it um, here for fortnightly reports. I want to maintain that because it does show the public that um, that we do care and that we want to see the resolution but it is not going to be hijacked um, in order to um, uh, allow for um, the raising of questions that could be resolved in another way. So if you leave that with the Chief Executive and myself, uh, we will um, find a better way of um, enabling councillors to ask their questions in advance so that uh, we can include what is required to be included in the appropriate reporting framework. And Thank you. If I can just add to that, Mayor. Yes, please. Right. Uh, I think the other thing is because sometimes people forget what has already been answered. Uh, often that is verbal because the questions are asked in council. So I'm quite clear, having listened to these a number of times, that we're going to have a question and answer log 
we will keep that updated so we can actually say, actually, we answered that question three weeks ago and the answer is no different. Yeah. So actually, and if members have that, they can remind themselves as well. And just to assist that, maybe you could have a number be beside it and how many times a question has been asked and answered. Yeah, I'm not no, 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 Templeton, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That is carried. Thank you very much. Right, the 